Okay, Rabbi, it is that time. It is time for our hot topic of the day. And that hot topic is, who was the fourth man in the fire? Many say it was Jesus. Was it an angel? Was it, you know, someone else? So with what you understand about the Hebrew text and what this whole process is all about, would you please enlighten us? I'd be glad to. I, I, I think this should, actually, we're, we're talking, we, we are discussing the third chapter of the book of Daniel. Uh, for those of you who have not studied Daniel, you have no idea what you're missing. Moreover, Daniel has is twelve is comprised of twelve chapters, but the first six chapters are different than the last six. The first six are very much like reading the Torah, meaning you're, you're reading about a narrative of 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 of, of a great man of God. Probably one of my, maybe my fav, one of my favorite people in history, uh, and that's uh, the, and Daniel, and um, but Daniel chapter three requires an introduction. What occurs in Daniel chapter three? The the time period is the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire emerges nineteen years before the destruction of the first temple. And the king of Bovel was Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar had set up a gold, a huge gold statue, and it was declared that every person must bow down and worship this stat, this gold stat, this immense gold statue. And whoever doesn't is going to be put to death. Okay? Now, just a background of what is happening here. Why would Nebuchadnezzar, why would it be important to him to set up a, an immense statue made out of gold? So the only way to understand Daniel chapter 3 is to do what? To look at Daniel chapter 2, okay? So in Daniel, so just really simple because you need to, know the chapter that introduces it and why this is very significant. In the second chapter of the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has a dream. He refuses to tell anyone what he dreamt, but he demands that all of his advisors and magicians and astronomers, astrologers, that they tell him what the dream was and interpret it, and of course none of them can. And Daniel sees the, is, is able to do the, the unimaginable. And that is that Daniel is able to see this, a tell, means it's even more than what Joseph did in the sense that Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream, but Daniel actually tells, the, because Nebuchadnezzar was no idiot. He knew uh, he knew about the past, that people can overlay any kind of interpretation once they hear the dream. So Nebuchadnezzar wanted to be really sure that the, whoever is interpreting his dream was telling the truth. So he, he, demanded, to, he demanded to that whoever is going to interpret him has to tell him what he dreamt. This way he's sure. If you couldn't figure out what I dreamt, then, you, then I'm going to pay very careful attention to your interpretation. As it turns out, of course, Daniel, Daniel, who declares it's not me, but God has given me this information, I will tell you a dream and I'll tell you what it means. Now, then, da Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that in your dream you saw this great statue. The head was gold. This is very critical. Now, there's going to be four parts of this statue, this chapter 2. The head is gold, the chest is silver, the legs, thighs are bronze, and the feet are clay and iron. Okay? We're going to see the number four all over the place, especially in the latter prophets. And the four always, this, these, this number four, are always referring to the four kingdoms that would subjugate the Jewish people, namely Bavel, Babylon, 
followed by Persia, Cyrus the Great, and the kings, the other Persian kings that would follow, and then Greece, the next kingdom, Yovan, and finally the, the fourth kingdom, which is the most horrible of all, this is Edom, this is the last kingdom, so there are the four kingdoms, and that's why you have the four horses of different colors, the four chariots, uh, the four beasts, the four winds in Daniel 7. Okay, so now the key is that Nebuchadnezzar is told that the head is gold, and that represents Babylon. But there are subsequent kingdoms that will arrive, rise following the kingdom of gold. Following, by the way, in, in, in Daniel chapter 7, the Babylon is represented by the lion, uh, who ultimately remo- loses its wings, loses its ability to walk on four legs, and given the heart of a human rather than that of a lion, so it, it loses its power. The key point is, this is disconcerting to Nebuchadnezzar. He, he doesn't want any silver bronze, clay, iron. He's not interested in any of that. He wants it all gold. And that's the key to unlocking Daniel chapter 3. The reason why a statue that is now all gold is in contrast uh, to juxtapose against the the image. The vision was you're only the head, but after you follows a whole series of other kingdoms that will will replace your kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar is going, no, it's all a gold, it's, well, the whole thing is gold, and that's what he sets up, this immense gold statue. His purpose is not just to have uh, a few people, namely Shadrach, uh, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, those are the three companions of Daniel. Uh, those are the names given to them early on in the book of Daniel. But really the purpose of this really is, uh, uh, the purpose was that the advisors of Nebuchadnezzar had set this up, that the Jews themselves are in rebellion against Babylon. It was to destroy the Jews. And you see that if you go to Daniel chapter 3, verse 8, you'll see there that it's very, very specific, that it says there very specifically that this was to demonstrate that the Jews are not adhering to this, not just these three individuals. Now, the key point is, they are, they, they, the satraps, these are the governors, these are leaders, these are like people in Nebuchadnezzar's um, cabinet, his secretary of state, his, you know, his, his major advisors, they point out to him, they want to show that the Jews are, are, will, will refuse to bow down the statue. I already shared with you chapter 2. You understand how meaningful this is in chapter 3? Because it means you're not bowing down to, to Nebuchadnezzar's God, but his God is himself. His God is Babylon. The whole thing is gold. Okay, that's the key. And if you could destroy the Jews, that means if the Jews would have bowed down to this golden statue, they would have been destroyed. I mean, they could have theoretically been destroyed because God will not tolerate idolatry ever. What, happen, what happens, this is a very famous event in Jewish history, we're talking roughly two and a half thousand years ago, that these three companions of Daniel were very faithful to the God of Israel. They refuse uh, to bow down to the golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. And Nebuchadnezzar directs his his workmen to to turn up the heat on the oven because he said if someone bowed down to it, they'll be burnt alive. Seven times hotter than even normal. And the three of them actually fell into the pit and into the pit of fire. Uh, the, the reason, by the way, why they fall into the pit rather than are thrown in is that it was so flaming hot 
that the, 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 the guy, the men who brought them up and they were fettered, they were all tied up, they, the, 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 the fire, the heat, killed the very people, the executioners, who were to toss them in. That's how hot this fire was. What happens next? Nebuchadnezzar looks inside the, in, inside this fire. He's able to look down inside, which itself is miraculous. The Talmud discusses there are actually six miracles that occurred there. And what he sees is he sees the three. He sees Shadrach, Meshach, and Avednego um, there. Their, their ropes have been removed, but the fire is not touching them. Their clothes, their hair, perfect. And he sees that there is, incidentally, just as a, a minor point, Daniel chapter 2, from towards the beginning of chapter 2 until the end of chapter 7, is all in Aramaic. So the text says, Vereve di revia domek levar elehin, which means that that the fourth there was a fourth being inside this inside this furnace that walking around with the other three and the fourth one appeared levar el levar elohin which means like a, like an angel now, that's not literally what it means levar var means a son in aramaic because we're in, this is all aramaic these chapters um, and a, a son of God is the language Tanakh uses to describe either the Jewish people or to describe angels. In this case, it's being used to describe an angel. We see the exact same language. You go, angels? Son of God? What do you mean? Well, that's the language of Scripture. Uh, there's so many examples of this. For example, in the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Elihim that the that the angels came uh, to to God and Satan came along with them. Remember that? So but if you look at the Hebrew, so Bnei Elohim is is the equivalent of that's Hebrew, the equivalent of Levar Elohim which is Aramaic, and they're extremely close. As I've shared previously on the show, Aramaic and Hebrew are not just similar languages, but they're actually sister languages. So if you read Hebrew, you can usually pick up the Aramaic fairly well. Um, so what, we, what Nebuchadnezzar encounters is he sees like something that's an angel walking around. Now, in case any of you wonder, well, how do you know it really is an angel and it's not Jesus? Because an angel is a messenger. It actually says it explicitly in the text. If you just keep reading, so most people just stop reading right there and go, the fourth one is Jesus. Why? Why Jesus? Why not somebody else? I don't know. In fact, we are introduced to a number of angels throughout the book of Daniel. Um, we have Michael, we have Gabriel. Throughout all these, these last texts who live towards the end of the prophetic period. But in fact, if you look at, at Daniel chapter 3, verse 28, after the three men come out of the... After the three men men come out of the fiery oven and they come out with not even a hair singed, their clothing not burnt, but the, the chains, the, the ropes that bound them have been burnt off, which was an incredible miracle. Nebuchadnezzar says, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Avednego. He says, and what does he say there? He says, <clears throat> That the, um, he says, who, who sent his angel and delivered his servants. The Shlach Malache Veshaziv Lavidohi, which means he sent his angel, which is Malche, his angel, 
v'sheiziv la'av la'av lavdohi in order to save or deliver his servants. Uh, Daniel 3.28. So it's specifically there. I mean, if you have any question about the identity of, the, of who is this fourth being in the oven with, with the three, it, we, it, we have this passage just three verses later that tells us specifically that it's a malach, which is an angel. And by definition, an angel, malach means messenger. So when a king, and it says that literally God sent the messenger. So the messenger is clearly not God. The, the messenger is an angel. And therefore we, can, we know with certainty, because we, we're using the, just this fundamental, the most rudimentary uh, rules of hermeneutics that we have scripture interpret scripture. So if you're uncertain about who is this son of God, even though this term is used in scripture to describe an angel or angels, as I mentioned before in Job chapter 1 verse 6, in just three verses later, we're told literally that Nebuchadnezzar is blessing the God of these three great men who sent his angel to deliver his servants. So it's clearly articulated there. Now, the question is, why was there an angel in, the, in this oven, in this kiln? I mean, why did God send a... So that why was it important? I think now you know the answer. Why was it important for four beings to be in the fiery furnace and survive it? Why? Well, now you know why. Because it is, what is this, what is being conveyed? What is the message? It's the similar message that we see earlier on with Abraham defeating the four kings in Genesis 13 and 14. A bush that just wouldn't be consumed. Four that survive a fire. And that is that the Jewish people would survive every one of these great kingdoms. They would survive Bavel, they would survive Persia, they would survive Greece, and they would survive Edom. This is extremely important to the, to the book of, to to Daniel, because and Daniel is going to in chapter seven going to describe the four winds that are going to blow at the sea, and from the sea is going to emerge these four beasts or like beasts and each one of them is conveying a different message so therefore the why was important to Hashem that when Nebuchadnezzar would look inside the oven look inside that fiery furnace he would see four and he would not see three is for the same reason that the four is all over the scripture just like the statue prior in chapter two the statue is made up of the head of gold, the chest of silver, the thighs of bronze, and the legs of clay and iron. The fourth kingdom is always the most terrible. It's always, um, Daniel's absolutely shocked when he sees the fourth kingdom in, in, um, in, in chapter 7. It's it, the four horses. The fourth color is this very, very strange ash color. It's a mixture. And that's because the fourth kingdom is clay and iron that don't adhere to each other. And that's Rome. So, yes, the Roman Empire would emerge and would subjugate the Jewish people. And, and Pompeii would enter Jerusalem in 66 BCE. But Rome wouldn't remain monolithic. It would go through enormous changes. And ultimately, Rome would... Uh, would would become uh, you know the uh, would become Christianity and Christianity would not only not remain monolithic but it would emerge as the most variegated religion of the world with the massive schisms of the 11th century 1054 of the East and West the Reformation of the 16th century and so on and this still to this day the European Union is still trying to destroy Israel each and every day they're plotting our destruction so 
there's, there's two layers here when looking at Daniel chapter 3. Number one, we want to know what the identity is. So that is a malach, it's an angel. But the, other, the underlying question is, why was it important that when Nebuchadnezzar would look in the oven, he would see four and not three? Is because this is a picture of what the Jewish people would survive. And that is they would survive four kingdoms. That was the whole purpose of it. And that's why, my friends, at the Passover Seder, how many cups of wine do we drink? We drink four cups of wine, right? Why do we drink four cups of wine? The Torah uses four words to describe God's redemptive power. And why four? You now know the answer. Because God would redeem us from four kingdoms that would subjugate the Jewish people. And therefore, don't ask me why the Ming Dynasty is not mentioned. Ming Dyn- the Chinese never subjugated Jewish Lime. They didn't destroy the temple. So we're not talking about the Ming Dynasty or whatever dynasty, Ming dynasties in the East. So that's why at the Pesach Seder, what do we do? We drink four cups of wine. Why four? Why not 11? Why not two? Why not three? Why four? Why was it important that he sees four survive? We survive four. That the reason is, is that each one of those cups represents God's, that God delivered us from four kingdoms. And then, wait, there's the fifth, the fifth cup. But the fifth cup we don't drink from. And that's, in fact, the kingdom of God, which will destroy the final kingdom. And that's the destruction of Edom, which is prophesied in the book of, in Sefer Oivadra, in the book of Obadiah. And that's the stone that we saw, that, that Daniel saw or interpreted in Nebuchadnezzar's dream that would smash the, the uh, final kingdom and, and, and that would be the end of it. And as we see at the end of in, in Daniel chapter 7, at the very end of the chapter, it tells us that the final kingdom will be completely destroyed. Unlike the previous kingdoms, that of Babylon, Persia, and Greece, where each kingdom turned it over to the next. They weren't destroyed completely. The lion doesn't die. You notice that? The bear doesn't die. The leopard doesn't die. Because what happens is the, the, the Persians weren't stupid. They obviously, whatever was valuable of Babylonian a culture and gods and so on, they adopted it. Just like after the United States uh, won, won the War of Independence against Britain, it didn't start speaking uh, Spanish. I mean, it didn't start, you know, didn't adopt, start speaking, I don't know, Zulu. It, 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 made, it kept even the names of, of the cities in the United States or all over England. Why? They maintained it and so on. There was no reason to get rid of it. But the difference is at the very end of days when Mashiach comes, and that's the kingdom of God, so then the final kingdom will be destroyed completely and there'll be nothing left of it. But we have not yet reached that moment. It appears that we are at the very end. That means the morning is soon coming. B- blessed is the Lord, blessed are you, King of the universe, who gave the rooster, Blessed is the one who could distinguish between day and night. And that is, blessed are you, who it's still night. Israel is still despised. It's still hated. The world still plots on destruction. But now, before the morning comes, before arise and shine, your light has come, before that, you recognize the God of Israel while it's still dark. Blessed are you who recognizes that the, recognizes that the morning is soon coming. And that's the blessing a Jew makes in the morning. We're not blessing God that roosters have insight and they know when morning is coming. This is the first the blessing and a whole series of blessings 
we make is not that roosters are great alarm clocks, but what the roosters do, you wouldn't know this if you grew up in Brooklyn. I had no idea. But as it turns out, in Indonesia, I found out that roosters start doing their cock a doodle doo. They start making these very loud noises while it's still dark. Before the sun comes, they're already, they're already making their noises. So blessed are you who knows that the morning is soon coming, who turns back to the God of Israel, who embraces your true lover, your true husband, who is the Lord of hosts, is his name. Isaiah chapter 54. Adon Olah, Asher Malach, Beterem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, Bechef Tzokol, Azai Melech, Azai Melech, Shemu Nikra, Veachare, אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נסע בחפצה כל הזיים אל איך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה